Good. Now uh, we're going to pray. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Lord, we, um, uh, we, we, we need to learn a lot from you every day. And thank God for these good people who are these, these faithful of yours who are gathered and um, um, are hungry for your word. So um, help all of us to um, hear your word today uh, as we need to hear it. And I make this prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Okay. Now, there's um, going to be some um, interesting things here uh, that we'll study today in these last two chapters. Uh, what I'd like to do is, um, let's see. Yeah. Yeah, would somebody like to read the, uh, the first 10 verses? Uh, by the way, chapter four, chapter four is where we are. Mm -hmm. yeah. All right. Well, I don't see, not seeing any, um, why don't I appoint you, Seth? Oh, I'm sorry. Oh, Liz. Okay. So the first 10 verses, all right. Okay. Four, uh, 10. Uh, no, no, four, one no. through 10. Uh, chapter four, verse 10. For one through ten. Oh, one through ten. Okay. Yeah. Mm -hmm. What causes war and mm. what causes fighting mm. among you? Is it not your passions that are at war in your members? You desire and do not have, so you kill. And you convert, co covet, and cannot obtain. So you fight and wage war. You do not have because you do not ask. You ask and do not receive because you ask wrongly to, excuse me, to spend it on your passions. Unfaithful creatures, do you not know that friendship with the world is enmity with God? Therefore, whoever wishes to be a friend of the world makes himself an enemy of God. Or do you suppose it is in vain that the scripture says he yearns jealousy over the spirit which he has made to dwell in us? But he gives more grace, therefore, it says, God opposes the proud, but gives grace to the humble. Submit yourselves, therefore, to God. Resist the devil, and he will flee from you. Draw near to God, and he will draw near to you. Cleanse your hands, you sinners, and purify your hearts you men of do double mind. Be wretched and mourn and weep. Let your laughter be turned into mourning and your joy to dejection. Humble yourselves before the Lord and he will exalt you. Yeah. Well, a lot here. Um... But you'll notice what, what, what is the key point that unites the whole section here is this, uh, that, the, that the love of the world is, a, is, is uh, makes one an enemy of God, and that the real battle in our life is about desire. Um, and what do we desire? And so we need to talk about these kinds of things. We need to talk, first of all, about desire. He, he starts out with that. And then he focuses the, the, the problematic aspect of our desire, which is very often we're very worldly. Um, and we don't, uh, we don't have a, um, um, uh, we don't really have a desire for the things of God. Now, this is a critical thing, if we can just maybe do a little bit of background here first, because in a way, let me, let me, I'll say something that may, may seem untrue, but I hope to show that it's largely true, that what you get, you want. Now, I don't mean literally everything, you know, you want to leave a tall building in a single bound, uh, you might you might do a few spirit, you know push-ups or whatever, but you'll never really get that. But the point is that uh, what if you really want something in life, 
and are really wor- wor- and you really want it, you'll probably work hard enough to get to get it. Now that I mean that's a general norm, but even more important, I'm not so worried about that. But in effect, what the Lord is saying to us is regarding our final destination. What you want, you get. If you want heaven, it's yours. But here are some of the things that are true about heaven that you need to start to desire, you see, because you've heard me say this over and over again, that heaven isn't just your designer paradise. It isn't just some place that is suited to your wishes. Uh, okay, I'll have a golf course and uh, I'll drive a Mercedes Benz and, you know, whatever you could imagine, you know. Um, it isn't, that's not what heaven is. Heaven is the kingdom of God with all of its values. And so you've heard me on this before, but again, a lot of those values people don't want, like chastity or love of enemy or um, forgiveness, mercy. Uh, God is worship, not me. You know, I, you know you, so, so you see, um, it is not simply, oh, but Father, Father, everybody wants to go to heaven. No, not, not necessarily. Not the real heaven. Um, the heaven that uh, we're in, our heart has to be converted for what heaven actually is. So I don't know if uh, I, I've, I've mentioned this book to you before, but if you have not read The Great Divorce, some of us actually in this class before the plague, we actually um, read C.S. Lewis's Great Divorce. Uh, we, I, we didn't do all the things, but I, I selected about five or six of the scenarios out of it and and we actually played it we read the parts like a play i don't know if a couple of you remember that you know in that class and what we found out there was that a lot of people came up on a, basically the scenario of c.s lewis's book the great divorce is that a bunch of people come up is it from hell or from purgatory um or just just the world but they come up on a bus to tour heaven and most of them don't like it the grass is too hard the um uh People are up there that, how did you get here? You know, uh, and, and uh, all but one or two of them get on the bus and go back to hell. They, they just, they're not interested in it. It's just too quirky or weird or too hard, or I don't like the feeling of the grass on my feet. And, but even more than that, they're not willing. These stories, each person has a very personal story. For example, there, there, there's one story about a woman. I want to be quick because I can't give you all the details of the story, but she got off the bus from hell or wherever, and uh, she um, was saying, well, why is my son not here to meet me? Where is he? Because he had apparently died in a tragic accident many years before. And um, come to see her brother shows up to meet her and give her a quick tour. He said, well, why didn't you, why didn't my son greet me? Why are you here? I came to see my son. And he said, well, you, 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 you can't see him right now. But, you know, why can't I see him right now? Well, he's here, but you can't see him right now. Anyway, long story short, he works with her to appreciate that she's turned her son into an idol. And she said, until you learn to love God above all things and above all people, you can't see him because you have to see him in God. So in other words, you might think, well, what's more beautiful than the love of a mother and, and, and uh, for her son who was tragically lost? I mean, that's a beautiful thing. But we can turn even the most beautiful things into a substitute for God. Heaven is about God, and, and we will be with our loved ones, but we'll, we'll be with them in and through the beautiful light and the glorious love of God. And so again, uh, that's just one example. There's all these subtleties to the stories that, that, that people have. But not all, most of them aren't outright wicked people. They're decent people, but they just, they just don't want heaven on its terms. They want it on some other term. They don't want to give up a, a philosophy or a way of thinking or an idol. Or, you know, they, they don't want to uh, have to sing hymns and dorky, you know, uh, uh, you know and praise God and, and, and things. So anyway, all of them have these subtle things. I really encourage you. I, I, I'd like to do more if we can get through the plague, or maybe we can even do it here online where we would maybe with more of you here, go through some of those scenarios, maybe five, four or five of them at some point. C.S. Lewis, the, uh, the, um, uh, the Great Divorce. Okay. Now again, getting back to James, there is for us right now then, and all the saints say the same thing. Look, the real battle is a battle about desire. What do you want? Do you want the world and his trinkets or do you want God and what he's offering? Now here's the twist. 
The world and the devil often, often give rather immediate gratification, and then the bill comes. Whereas God says, let's pay some of the bill forward, you know, suffering and death, in other words, so that you can really enjoy what's waiting for you on the other side, um, and, and, and it'll be debt-free. <laughs> Right. Now, I mean, I'm being a little facetious here, but you, you see the vision is that um, uh, you've heard the old expression, a bird in the hand. One bird in the hand is worth two in the bush. This bird I got right here now is worth more to me than the two I might get someday tomorrow, even though there's twice as many. We, 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 like, we tend to like present pleasures than, rather than future ones. So there's this battle of desire in our heart. And the question keeps coming back. What do you really want? Do you want the world and its trinkets? Or do you want the kingdom of God and, all, and, and, God, and God himself and all he offers? And it's not a slam dunk. It's not a, it's not a, it's not a no-brainer. There's a lot of people who just aren't willing to make the journey or to let God work in their hearts so that we can begin to desire the very things he's offering, okay? Um, we need a conversion of desires. Now, we also know that after original sin, we have, a, we have fallen natures that even after baptism, we have a weakness called concupiscence, um, which uh, strongly inclines us to sin. And we, whoever's coming in, let's see. Okay. Um, so, in other words, the idea being that, um, um, uh, what was I saying? I lost my place. Um, concupiscence. Oh yeah, concupiscence. It's a strong inclination to sin, and but you know, we, if you think about it, we've got a screw loose, don't we? I mean, you could ro move your head and hear it rolling around up there. I mean, we desire things that we know are harmful, and very often we desire them in abundance, and we don't desire things that are uh, good for us. Now, it just starts when you're a kid when you want Twinkies rather than green beans or broccoli, you know. Um, but I mean, I'm thinking now spiritually again, we know, we know, we, we seem to desire things that really can harm us and we want them in abundance, even though we know they'll harm us, you know? And so things like uh, alcohol and abundance or uh, illicit sexual union or money or wealth or power and uh, so, so many of these things, we know how harmful they can be. Jesus says how hard it is for the rich to enter the kingdom of heaven. Yeah, I know, but I still, I still want to be rich. <laughs> You know, don't tell me that that is you wouldn't want to win the lottery. All right. Come on. You know, and I mean, so again, even though the Lord warns us, we still want it. And we don't want things like prayer, uh, scripture. You know, and again, some of you are above average here, right? You're studying with this loudmouth priest tonight. But what, what I want to see is, is I want you to see, though, is that we do have a real battle. There's a fallenness, a woundedness to our nature that the church terms concupiscence. But it, again, it all comes back to this real fundamental question. What do you want? Because what you want, you get. If you want the kingdom of heaven, it's yours. If you don't want it, you don't have to have it. You can make other arrangements. And if you're banking on the world, it'll fail you. And then you'll have to live apart from God because you won't want what he's offering. And there's a certain, you know, you might sound, this might sound funny, but there's a certain mercy in, 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 in there being a hell, because God does allow people who just don't want what he's offering to live apart from him. But he does warn that that's a very unhappy existence. Well, how can anybody be that stupid? Well, how can Adam and Eve be that stupid? He said, look, I only ask you one thing. Don't eat that piece of fruit, because if you do, suffering and death will be your lot. And they did it anyway. See? So, again, all these are ways of saying there's just something desperately wrong with us. And it's a real battle, a real battle to overcome this. And so this is the real drama of your life and the, and the drama of the, people, the life of people you love. What do they want? What will they choose? Okay. It's the great drama of our life. So what we're about to enter into now has that kind of a, I just wanted to kind of paint a bigger picture for you. Okay. So the first thing that James points out is that, you know, we live in a world of conquest, of wars, of strife, of uh, bitterness. There's a, there's a lot of sources, but he says, basically, where do these quarrels and, and all these things, um, you know, wars and fights among you, where do they come from? Is it not from your passions or your desires, in other words, that are within you? Um, and so people will, nations will conquer other nations to gain land. Um, 
people will will uh, you know you know people will either steal or or uh, act unjustly uh, for for you know to gain things. Um, people will um, you know again through illicit sexual union will 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 either cheat on their spouse or or um, um, you know do terror you know sleep with someone who isn't their spouse and on and on I could go. But all these there's a way of of of, of taking what's not mine and and stealing and and this this leads to conflict and anger and retribution and so uh, we take what we want uh, because we want it. And so he's he's pointing out to us not just the big wars between nations, but also the wars with well, among us. That's mine. Don't touch it. Um, you can't have this. Or yes, I can. Or I can take it. If, even if it is yours, I can still take it. So all of these are ways of saying that we um, um, this, our passions that wage war within us make us act in ways that are often unjust. And injustice leads to anger and bitterness and wars and conflicts. And uh, we... Um, okay. uh, so we, we start to see that, first of all, there's a war. And then the th third level of the war is right within us. And we're going to see he develops that next. Um, all right. So it goes on to say here, um, you desire and do not have, so you murder. Now, that sounds extreme, right? But I mean, most people who murder don't just get up one day and just go kill somebody unless they're psychotic. There's usually something, there's some conflict that's developed between them and this other person. Very often, for example, in, in the inner, you know, in not, they're not so much inner city anymore, but among gangs, you know, look, you're on my territory. Uh, I sell in this corner. I sell rocks here. You go away. No, I'm going to sell here. And this is a conflict. Uh, and, and eventually it ends in killing. Um, and so we see that um, uh, there are real case scenarios where this kind of stuff unfolds, right? Or a man steals another man's wife and he's so angry that he goes and kills him, you know, and so on. So I, I could just, I, I know that James may go, he's going to the extreme. But again, I, I can only say to you that the, the, the as we've been seeing in recent weeks and months, that uh, the injustice of this world often causes, causes great, great anger and bitterness. And it leads to an explosion of anger at times that overflows and there is looting and killing and burning and taking and stealing. Um, civil unrest, you know, and things like this are come from somewhere. They don't just come out of nowhere. Uh, so a lot of this again comes back to um, the injustices and so on that, that we both participate in and are victims of. Okay. Now um, you desire and do not have, so you murder, you covet and cannot obtain. So you fight and quarrel. Uh, so, uh, again, um, you have more than I do. Why is that? That's not fair. And you fight and you quarrel and we, you know, e you know p people and nations will even go to war and, and the fisticuffs over these things, right? Now, in our culture, um, we have a, a more theoretical version of this. It's usually called class struggle or class envy. Um, and uh, there's, a, there's a lot of that that's fueled, you see, in our our culture. There are real injustices, but it doesn't follow that everyone um, uh, who has wealth has it unjustly, you see. So with all that in mind, I mean, these are the kinds of conflicts and struggles that, that, that James is talking about here. Now, um, it says here, th this is a, I often quote this, you have not because you ask not, that's the old, the older translation, but you, ha you do not have because you do not ask. So first of all, if you feel like you're lacking something and you need it, go to God and ask, or maybe ask somebody, could I borrow this or could you, could you help me? Um, I need some, you know, and so again, the first obligation, if you're lacking in something that's necessary, especially is to, is to ask for help, ask God, but also ask other people. Um, most people when they, they know or admit, are, are, are willing in a general sense are willing to help. Uh, there, uh, there are, we all know there are members of our family, though, that wear us out, right? <laughs> now, I don't have any nuts falling out of my family tree, but I know some of y'all do, right? Where, again, they, uh, we want to help them, but they do kind of wear us out. But as a general norm, most people, if you're living your life in communion with other people um, and you need something, you're, 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 you're going to, you know, people will willingly help you. Now, I, a lot of times when homeless people come to the door and then homeless, or maybe they're from the shelter, I say to them, well, where's your family? Because they're asking me, you know, he said, you're coming here to ask me for food or money, but where's your family? Well, they're, they're, they all seem to be in North Carolina. I, I don't, I don't know. <laughs> 
I'm just kidding, but it's almost always the answer. I get well all down in North Carolina. I said, well, why are you up here? Well, da, 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 no, you get some long time. Okay, well, okay, so your family's not here. Where are your friends? Do you have any friends? Well, you know how it is. Fun. Do you have a church community? Of course, you must go to church every Sunday. And No. So I said, your problem isn't just that you're hungry or need money. Your problem is you're alone. And so what God wants us to do is to learn to live in community with one another. And so I say this, let's say, let's say the guy's name is Joe. Joe, if you should have a church. Home. I want to invite you to come and join our church. And you know, what you do is, you know, the way your life works is that you come, you join the church, you get to know people, you help us set up tables and chairs for the Reverend Chicken Dinners and, and um, for other events. You're here, um, you're worshiping with us. People know you, they know your name. And then if you come, you, you come into some trouble, you've got a hundred people that are willing to help you. You see, so we need to learn how to stay connected because a real social security, or I mean, a real safety net is, is not just some check. It may or may not come on time from the government. It usually takes months. <laughs> you know, when, 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 uh, when days matter, the government will be there in years. <laughs> yeah. Okay, don't worry. We're putting up some low-cost housing nearby. Ten years later, it's still not built. But anyway, um, the point being is that um, uh, the way life works is you have not because you ask not. It's not just, you know, you talking to God, but it's also being in relationships with one another where – if I have a need, there are many people there to help me. So uh, when I was sick, I had maybe almost a million people praying for me because I'm on the radio and it goes all over the world. And, or, uh, you know, if I, I don't have all the gifts, but you don't have all the gifts, but together we have all the gifts. So I, if we're going to have an event, I don't know how to, I'll burn the salad if I try to cook a meal. So I, I ask people in the parish who can cook to help and they prepare the meal. So it's not just money. Or, you know, but it's, it's just all the things that we need. If we live in true communion, we can ask. <laughs> and sometimes the answer will be no. But as I say, generally speaking, if you are in a, a, a good communion and community with other people, they're going to be there to help you. And that's part of the body of Christ. Christ isn't just some pie in the sky. I'll drop it out of heaven onto your head. Uh, he uses his, his body, the church, to feed and clothe and and so on. So I want to not let this become too abstract about, you know, you, oh, Lord, Lord, give me, give me. Well, you've heard my little joke before, right? A young lady went to pray. He said, Lord, give me a kind heart. And give me a pure heart. But above all, give me a sweet heart. <laughs> and suddenly the door knocks and in walks Prince Charming, you know. <laughs> you know, it, life doesn't just work that way. She needs to go out and get to know people and be in community, and he'll come along, you see? So the Lord will answer, but 99 times out of 100, he's going to answer me through somebody else, all right? So I don't want to spend, I'm, I'm spending too much time on all this, but I, I, I just, I, I, I think that we have to be careful not to turn this into a kind of shazam in the name of Jesus. I want to Mercedes Benz, and um, uh, it ain't happening, okay? Uh, because you'll see here in the next line, you know, you're asking for all the wrong stuff anyway. But, but at the end of the day, the way life works is we go to God and we pray, but we also learn to ask each other. But you don't, you you shouldn't need to ask strangers. You should have community or communion with other people, and that becomes um, the true source where we share rather than you got what I want, I'm going to take it. You know, um, I'm going to kill you. I'm going to, you know, you know, do that kind of stuff. Uh, you're richer than I am. And I resent you. So I'm going to break into your store and steal and then set the whole place on fire or whatever it might be, you know? Okay. So the more subtle and the more extreme versions of this stuff. Now we move on. Um, it says here, uh, you, you have not because you ask not. Verse three, you do not receive because you ask wrong. You spend it on your passions. Now, in other words, we go to God and we ask for the sometimes uh, very inappropriate things, or it's what we don't ask for. So, for example, you know, you've heard my little um, thought on this before, most of you, but for those of you who haven't, I mean, you know, when you listen to people sometimes praying out loud, like at revivals or whatever, it's always about something worldly, or even our so-called spiritual lives. We're asking about mostly worldly stuff, you know, fix my health, fix my finances, fix my spouse. Fix my, um, you know, in other words, Lord, make this world more comfortable for me. Uh, and, uh, you know, I'll, I'll go and I'll just stay here forever. Give me enough friends. Give me enough creature comforts. And, you know, I'll be okay. What a disgrace. Lord, give me a desire for holiness. 
give me a desire, you know, for chastity. Give me a desire for, you know, to, to love other people. Give me greater charity. See, do we ever pray like that? Heck no, if that's too scary, he might actually answer me, you know. I mean, so, so I think that, that um, um, we, um, there's an old spiritual along these lines that says, King Jesus is listening all day long just to hear some sinner pray. Hmm? And the idea is to pray about things that really matter. Now, again, don't, don't fail to pray about those other things. But the question is, how, does, how balanced is your prayer life? Is, is God really pleased with what you're asking for? See? Now, look, we all need a little bit of extra money or food or whatever. I got that. But do you ever ask for a little more holiness or a little more desire for prayer? Or do you ever ask for um, other virtues? Remember Solomon when he was young? God said, I'll grant you anything you ask. And he says, give me wisdom. And God was very pleased with that request. See? So, again, these are the things that, um, you know, we ask wrongly to spend it on our passions. And... Um, we're basically asking God to prop us up more in this world so we can have more of its trinkets and be drunk on its wine. So, okay. Uh, so, okay, yes, is there a question? There's someone on mute. Okay, but so the question is, is God pleased with the things you ask for? You know, now you're, most of you are parents um, and we've all been children. Uh, we, you often know if your kid, let's say your kid comes and say, I really want a flamethrower for Christmas. You're going to get that back. No, you shouldn't be asking for something like that. Or, um, you know, you, you know, they, 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 they want to the wrong, all the wrong kind of food, you know, just, just give me candy. I don't want to have to eat vegetables anymore. Well, no, you're asking for the wrong thing. You see, I have better things to offer you. And, um, so uh, this is kind of the analogy now. Um, Verse four, look at this. This is strong words. Now, you had a slightly different translation. He said, you adulterous people, adulterers. And he, he goes on to state why, but the point is that um, you're, you're, you're sleeping with the wrong God. <laughs> you know, God is the lover of your soul, and yet you're hanging out and sleeping with the world. And so he uses a very strong word. In other words, we become unfaithful to God. We become adulterers. And he goes on to say, you adulterous people, don't you know that friendship with the world is enmity with God? And whoever wishes to be a friend of the world makes himself an enemy of God? Hmm? So again, uh, this is very hard for us because we do love the world. And, you know, if you, if you deny it, I'm going to tell me you're, you, you have no love for the world. I'm going to deny it. I'm going to say you're lying. Adulterous people in Bible. Where's that? I didn't hear the question. Oh, okay. But again, all this is a way of saying that um, James is famous for using this really strong language. Um, we we want to make it more subtle and, yeah, I kind of love the world, but I, I, I love God too. And, you know, well, it sounds like you're, you're a bigamist. <laughs> you're a polygamist. Or you're polyamorous. <laughs> Now, again, this is a struggle for us. I'm not saying, hey, man, you're just all bad. James is going pow right between the eyes. But for us, we got to know this is a real struggle. And if I really, if, if I were to ask all of you or any group of people and myself, what do you love most, God or the world? And you go, oh, everyone can say God. That's the required answer. What's the real one? Okay. What is the real one? And, you know, we're very sensory. We're very visual. And because it's hard for us to see God in the way we're used to and, and hear his voice in the way we're used to hearing things and interacting with him in the way we're used to interacting, we go to what's familiar. See? So it, 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 it's, it's a long journey, a long, long journey to be freed of our attachments to the world. Hmm? Uh, if you go to my blog, just uh, you could, there's a, what are attachments and what are they not? See, so not everything's an attachment. Most of us need a certain amount of food and shelter and clothing and so on. But of course, we all know we want a lot more than we do need. And of course, I don't ever overeat. Oh, I just eat exactly what I need. And I don't have extra clothes in my closet, you know. And, you know, so you see. Um, and uh, so the point is that it, we desire excessively, not that we have any desire. We have some things we need in the world. And God knows that. Now, but here comes then maybe 
the journey that we need to make. And I've, I've seen it happen in loved ones, family and friends who make the journey. I've seen it with other people, but it's usually the deathbed where finally we let go of the last things. You know, there's a beautiful Psalm, Psalm 27 that says, there's only one thing I ask of the Lord. This alone I seek. Okay, you liar. <laughs> to dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life and to see his beautiful face, you know. Now, I mean, for most of us, we, we pray that in hope. <laughs> we don't seek just one thing, you know. One thing? No way. I mean, we're all, okay. But you see, but I've seen my father go through those stages, you know, where, you know, his daughter, my sister Marianne died at age 30 and he let go of her. And, uh, you know, my mom died 15 years later and uh, he said farewell to her and um, he sold the family house and all the things in it and uh, went into a, a kind of a retirement community. And, and then, you know, he began to lose his own health and little by little, he just gave everything back. And on his deathbed, he said, all I want now is to see God and I'm going to try to find Nancy, you know. So you don't have to kind of try to find her, you'll see. <laughs> but, you know, he says, I just, all I want now is to go home and be with God. My grandmother said the same thing. She said, why am I still here? I can hardly see you're here. I just want to go home and be with God. And a month later, God obliged her request. There, there comes this point where you're finally able to say, really, honestly, there's only one thing I ask, only one thing I seek. But until that time, it's a battle. It's a real battle. Okay. Now, James is kind of beaten up on us here a little, right? But engage the battle. Engage the battle. This is why the church encourages us to some prayer and fasting and abstinence. We don't do much of it anymore. We should probably do more. You know, we used to have ember days and other days where fat prayer and fasting and, you know, the Orthodox and the Eastern Christians put us to shame, you know. Um, but, um, but the idea here is to begin to say, I can live without this for a few days. And I, you know, I may need to make use of food or I may enjoy a drink, but I can do without it. Uh, and, and, and so the, the, this kind of the dress rehearsal. Um, but also, I think overall, you know, I, I think in my life, I've tried to simplify as I go. You know, I used to be a collector of all kinds of things and that was getting in the way, you know, and I gave up most of that stuff. And um, I still have my three genie bottles and a few of things, but, you know, but I would simply say that um, there's a, um, there's a journey to make, all right? And um, we want to get to that place. And, and I, I know the word adulterer is strong, but you know how some people can get so wrapped up in the world, it's power, it's prestige, or it's, it's possessions and trinkets and toys that, who's God, man? I mean, this is my, this is my honey, this is my honey, um, and, you, and you sleep with the world. And, uh, and you say, forget God, you know, and uh, that's adultery. That is adultery. All right. <clears throat> now it moves on here. It goes on to kind of double down some more. Or do you suppose, verse five, do you suppose that it's to no purpose? The scripture says he yearns jealously over the spirit that he's made to dwell in us. Um, now there's a, there's a, we usually think of jealousy as only a bad thing. No, there's actually a good jealousy. You know, I think every husband should be a little jealous uh, for his wife, you know. Uh, now, not too jealous where he's pathological and he's being, being he's doubting her and, and becoming suspicious. But when there's, when, when there's really something, there's a threat to his relationship with his wife, he's jealous and says, this, let's, let's, let's get rid of that, see? Um, and uh, so there's a certain proper jealousy. And God says, I'm jealous of you, or jealous for you. you know, you're mine. And you're running over to these prostitutes in the world. I mean, not literally, but I mean, it's a form of being unfaithful, see, and you're 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 prostituting with the world. So um, uh, now it goes on to say, um, uh, but but he gives more grace, but he but but he gives more grace. Therefore, it says God opposes the proud, but gives grace to the humble. Okay. So again, that's why what we've been just talking about. If we can just humbly admit that we've got this issue, and go to God and say, Lord, help me, because honestly. I am more passionate about things. A bird in the hand is worth two in the bush. And um, I want my dessert now. And I struggle with this, Lord. I, I do sometimes, uh, I'm more interested in watching TV than praying. I'm more interested in any in number of things and, and loving you and worshiping you. I'm, I'm more interested in, what you're, in many worldly things than what you're offering. And I'm just being honest, Lord, and, 
And God says, okay, now I'm going to give you grace because, you know, you've humbled yourself. See? God gives grace to the humble. And so I, I don't know about you, but I can say on my journey, I've simplified my life a great deal. And my life is increasingly more and more about one thing. Uh, I'm, I've got a long way to go. I'm not what I want to be, but I'm not what I used to be. And I hope that some of you can also testify that as you made your journey, especially if you're up in the years, you know, 60 and over, you've gone, you start to see, I've, I've left a lot of the clutter behind or, you know, I don't know, not everybody does, but I, I hope that some of you can testify that, you know, my life's gotten a lot simpler. And sometimes the Lord helps because there isn't a lot of stuff we can do anymore. We, you've got, you got old arthritis and old Arthur keeps visiting, you know, Uncle Arthur's back, you know, or uh, the knees go bad or, you know, um, you know, and frankly, um, you know, our, our strength and stamina. So in some ways, our life gets simpler, but you see the idea. <clears throat> to some degree, this plague has done that to us, hasn't it? You know, it said, you know, y'all running around all over God's green acre. You're sure in a big hurry. You don't have no idea where you're going, but you're sure in a big hurry to get there. And so I'm not saying God caused this, but God allowed, and uh, there's certain graces to say, you know, um, I was awfully busy. <laughs> and, and maybe sitting home and getting to know my family again and having fights, but still also <laughs> getting to know them again. And instead of just waving as you pass through the door, maybe these things help us to simplify. And, um, so again, all of these are just ideas, but God is God wants to give us the grace to do better. And he will give grace to the humble, okay? But he'll resist the proud. All right. I don't have any problem here, you know, I can do what I want. Nobody tell me what to do. You know, that's those are the proud. Okay, now um submit yourself therefore to God. <clears throat> resist the devil, and he will flee from you. Now Look at this. Um, submit yourself, therefore, to God. In other words, put, to submit means to send something under or to be sent under. So I'm under God's authority. Okay? Stop being such a rebel. Now, there's a lot of people in the world that, and here's the greatest problem. Many people sin through weakness, and, and they, they, know, they know how to repent, and, or at least they know what they're doing is wrong. Okay? But there are a lot of people today who sin through pride and malice. I will not be told what to do. There's nothing wrong with this, and take your your your, what's your your rosaries off my ovaries, and take your Bible out of my bedroom, and all that kind of talk. You know, the, sh the shaking of the fist. I will not be told what to do. Or what to, I will decide what I want to do, and I will decide whether it's right or wrong. This is a very sad situation today, um, <clears throat> and that's a sin that God can't forgive because they don't think it is a sin to be forgiven. So that, these are the things where I think we have to realize that um, submit yourself to God. Come under his joke. And even if you fall through weakness and struggle, at least you know how to find a confessional or get on your knees and say, Lord, help me. If it's, a, you know, in the smaller sins, but, but at least we, 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 we can, we, if we do sin, let's, let's let it be through weakness rather than through malice or pride. Okay. So this is the idea of being submitted to God. And goes on here to say then, Submit yourself to God and says, resist the devil and he will flee from you. Now, let's look at this word resist. Well, I resisted the devil, but he didn't go away. Well, what does it mean to resist? You know, anytime there's an R-E in front of a word, what does it mean? It means to do something again. Over. Yeah. So, uh, uh, so resist from, sister A comes from the Latin word um, sto stare, meaning to stand. Okay. So, when it says resist the devil, it means stand against him and stand against him again and stand against him again and stand against him again. It's an ongoing thing, this thing called resistance. It isn't just a one time or an occasional thing. It's an ongoing battle where you stand and you stand again and you keep standing, you see. So, so James isn't just being simplistic. Well, just resist the devil and he'll flee. Be gone, devil. And he goes, oh, I better go. <laughs> It's not, it's not that simple. Um, and um, once again, um, we, we've got we've to, you, know, um, uh, you know, let the devil know that we're serious, you see. Um, and we stand and we stand against him, okay? And God will give us the grace. But you see, these are the things that James is saying. And this is a real, again, let's not forget the context. This is a real, honest to gosh battle, a war in our heart between love of the world and love of God. And the devil's in there. Don't you really want that? Mm -mm -mm. Look, oh, look, oh, she's so fine, but she belongs to somebody else. I know, but he doesn't treat her right. 
You'd be better for her. Baby, you got the curves, I got the angles. Mm, 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 you know, or, you know, other, other, other types of things, you know, oh, come on, one more drink won't hurt anybody, you know, come on, you know, this is real battle, this is war, and um, to both moderate lawful pleasures and to resist sinful pleasures is, is required of us, it's war, y'all, it's war, and the devil's in the mix, and if you want to know, why some of your children and grandchildren or siblings or spouses are in the shape they're in. Don't, don't, you don't have to look too far. It's about this stuff. And it's about the devil. We have an enemy, Satan, and he is prowling. And he wants, he wants to grab us. Temptation is the work of the devil to drag you to hell. And you got to resist. Okay. Stand and stand again and keep standing. Okay. So, all right. I'm, I make it, I, I make the point enough. <laughs> so. Uh, goes on here to say, draw near to God, he'll draw near to you. Now, wait a minute. Um, uh, draw near to God and he'll draw near to you. Um, gee, does that mean... Uh, so, you see, what, what I, what I want to say here is, is that God... It's, remember how Jesus puts it this way? He says, I, behold, I stand at the door and I barge in. Is that what he says? No. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. Knock. And if anyone will open for me, I will enter, and he and I will sup or have dinner or, you know, have a meal together. You say, have a meal together? Is that the best you can do? <laughs> but you miss the idea. And I don't want just a meal. I want a mansion. I want to, you know, anyway. but, um, but the idea is a meal is a sign of intimacy in the ancient world. You know, the, the very, who, who, are, who are my brothers, those I eat bread with. Because in German, the word brot and bruter are the same root. Or com the word pan, you know, means bread uh, in almost every language. And so who are my companions? Those I eat bread with. Uh, who, who will accompany me? Those I eat bread with. You see the word bread. So bread or meal or sharing this is a sign of intimacy. See? And so the Lord is basically saying, behold, I stand at the door and I knock. And if anyone will open for me, I will enter, and he and I, she and I, will enter into a relationship of intimacy, of closeness, and I will transform your life. Okay? So draw near to God. In other words, answer the knock. King, see, I said, uh, somebody's knocking at your door. Oh, sinner, why don't you answer? Somebody's knocking at your door, right? So um, we have this... Um, uh, it's kind of like, a, the, that's, that's kind of the image. You draw near to God and he'll draw near to you. In other words, God doesn't barge into our life. So I, say, well, I wish he would. I wish he would. Um, some people say, why doesn't God show his face for heaven's sakes? Well, you know, who is the one who barges into your life, who's yelling and screaming in your ear all day long and in, 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 flashing all kinds of stuff at you all day long? That's the devil. That's the devil. But God is respectful. And he whispers, see? So draw, So the invitation is, draw near to God. And you're saying, oh, and God says, they're drawing near to me. I'll draw near to them, you see? Okay. Um, cleanse your hands, you sinners. Purify your hearts, you double-minded. Oops, there's that word. Again, purify your hearts, you double-minded. In other words, go to God and say, like I just said to you earlier, I admit it. I'm double-minded. I want two contrary things. Messed up, and if we're honest, we want 85 different things. Anyway, okay, you get the idea. Be, be wretched and mourn and weep. Let your laughter be turned to mourning and your joy to gloom. He sure is like the Old Testament prophets here, isn't he, man? Right? He's, you know, uh, but basically he's saying, you know, look, you're all worked up and joyful about things of the world. Um, but remember, Jesus warned, he says, those who are laughing today are going to weep tomorrow. Because they're laughing about the wrong stuff. See, and they're not crying about the right stuff. And so, again, we don't weep about things we should weep about, and we often laugh about things we have no business laughing about. And even the things we take joy in are passing pleasures. But why aren't, so for example, I, 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 and I, I want to be careful here because the way people worship is very culturally based, but I find it interesting that people kind of look like the frozen chosen in church. They're bored believers, distracted disciples, you know, and yet they're not that way at a soccer match. Somebody said to me, well, I'm Irish and we're just that way. We're stoical. And you're not stoical. Go to a bar. Go to a soccer match. You know, 
Uh, go to a football game. You know, there's this bag full of air being brought up and down a field, and people are going crazy and dressed up in weird things and t- wearing other people's names on their backs and numbers, and and they're all worked up, and it's like it's like the biggest thing in their whole life. And then they go to church, like, <laughs> you know. So again, this is the problem that we have with our heart, you know. Um, and and it's just, like, enjoy a good football game. That's not the point, but it, it's that we we. We, if we think that these trinkets of the earth should be our, our true joy, no, they're going away. The Redskins are no more. <laughs> the Washington football team. What a, what a ridiculous title. I mean, anyway, the Washington football team. Gosh. Anyway, but I, I, but I digress. Um, the, um, and it's okay to enjoy a few things, but the point is to, to just get so worked up about those things and then not mourn that people don't know Jesus, to not, to, to not mourn that 50 million, 60 million children in our country have been killed through abortion, to not mourn or, or weep at, at injustice and poverty. Uh, yeah. See? So again, uh, J- Jesus gives those, those uh, antitheses, you know, um, but woe to you who laugh now, for you will mourn, but you who mourn will one day laugh and rejoice. You'll, you'll see me and you'll rejoice. So again, this is the, that, where is your focus? And if you're laughing and celebrating about worldly things, enjoy for now. Uh, eat dessert first because, um, you know, trouble's coming. Okay, so, uh, all right. Now we see the, uh, it goes on to say here, um, humble yourselves before the Lord and he will exalt you. Now, uh, let's go on. Um, just read the next uh, 11 through uh, 12, 11 and 12 there, Liz, if you could. Do not speak evil against one another, brethren. He that speaks evil against a brother or judges his brother speaks evil against the law and judges the law. But if you judge the law, you are not a doer of the law, but a judge. There is one lawgiver and judge, he who is able to save and to destroy. But who are you that you judge your neighbor? Okay, be careful with this text because... Um, Stop there. But yeah, that's fine. But I'm, what I'm saying to all of us, be careful with this text because the, um, this idea, you shall not judge, doesn't mean that we shouldn't know right from wrong. We judge behavior, but we don't judge people. We don't always know people's motivations. We can't always see into their hearts. Um, pardon me for using this expression, but sometimes people are too stupid to go to hell. I mean, I mean, not everybody understands, and but even beyond the question of ignorance, um, there might be again some some struggles. Uh, you know, sometimes people who struggle with anger have been very deeply hurt in their life. Um, people who, um, um, you know, are are you know one of the saddest things I think to think about is is, is as terrible as sexual abuse is. You know. People who are sexual abusers were often abused themselves sexually. I'm not writing anybody off a blank check here and saying we shouldn't worry about all this stuff. I'm just simply saying that what the judgment we're forbidden is to make a judgment against a person's status before God or to in some way indicate that I'm better than they are or, or that I'm worse than they are before God. Um, so I would simply say uh, be careful because, you know, every now and again people try to shame you when you say, you know, you got to stop sleeping with your girlfriend, you know, uh, well, you're judging me. No, I'm judging your behavior. I love you and I care about you and I don't want you to go to hell. And the Bible says fornicators go to hell. So God has already made the judgment of, uh, on, on the activity. Um, I'm not judging you. Um, maybe you've been raised in, a, in an environment that makes light of this, whereas most, most of us who are older, you know, know that it was quite shocking, you know, to be shacking up. Uh, you know, it was, um, it was, you know, you know, so, but again, so I, I just want to say to be careful with this text. All right. Um, by the way, do not speak evil against one another, brothers. Hmm. So about 10 minutes into the debate last night, I turned it off. <laughs> I, mean, I, I, I mean, and it's, I'm talking about both sides now. I mean, just, blah, 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 you know, and they were name calling each other. One called one a clown, another one called him stupid. And like, Really? Okay. Okay. 
not fit for a Christian. <laughs> I turned it off. I turned it off. Um, my Our public discourse is really headed south. And um, as you heard me warn at masses uh, recently, please, go, we're going through a difficult time. There's a lot of invective and anger. But try to go through it as a good Catholic and a Christian. All right. Watch your speech. Pray for your enemies. Try to be listening as much as talking, you know, you know, et cetera. You know, pray the rosary. Pray the Divine Mercy Chaplet. Go to the Lord and fall on your knees and pray for this country. It is so bad now that we can't even have a good argument, let alone a, a conversation. There's a place for a good argument, but you have to sort of have mutual respect and you have to have kind of agree on certain terms and what they mean. And we're in a place now where there's really no, even no basis for an argument. If you can't even agree on such basic things like whether somebody's male or female, how, how are you going to have, okay, let's, we all agree about A. So based on that, let's, let's now look at about what we should do about B. And there's different opinions, but at least we all agree about A. But we don't even agree about A anymore. You know? So anyway, I don't want to go on and on. I got to keep moving. I'm, as usual, going too long. Uh, but again, um, the uh, do not. Someone had a point to make. Oh, okay. Mr. Gamble? Yeah, George, all right. Try to become a good listener. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's, it's hard, especially when you're in my business. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> you all are good listeners. <laughs> yeah. All right. Okay, this is a very fun little piece here. Um, so read 13 to the end of the chapter, uh, Liz, if you could. Come now, you who say, Today or tomorrow, we will go into such and such a town and spend a year there and trade and get gain. Whereas you do not know about tomorrow. What is your life? For you are a mist that appears for a little time and then vanishes. Instead, you ought to say, if the Lord wills, we shall live and we shall do this or that. It as it is, you boast in your arrogance. All such boasting is evil. Whoever knows what is right to do and fails to do it, for him it is sin. Okay. Now, um, James is cautioning against um, the arrogance of thinking that we're in control. Now you would say, wait a minute, Father, I, I'm in control. I got all the provisions laid up for the meeting tomorrow. Everything's set to go. Okay. But that's based on things you can't control, like the next beat of your heart. Or like that there won't be some kind of major natural disaster that prevents the meeting. Or you, can, you, you see how it goes. So control is kind of an illusion. I'm not saying don't get organized or never plan anything. But at the end of the day, always remember if God wills it. Hmm? If God wills it. Uh, see Deus Volt, if God wills it. Um, the, um, so, you know, I do, you, you've heard the old expression, I'll see you tomorrow. God willing and the cricks don't rise. You know, um, there's a, a, a tendency though, that we just have to go on and make our plans and think everything's going to be fine and settled. And then all of a sudden, uh, plague sets in. <laughs> Whoopsie. Uh, we had a lot of plans. I had a lot of plans and, <laughs> you know, I mean, I, I my plans fell through. <laughs> <laughs> and I lost about a third of my income, you know, because I do, uh, uh, I do get uh, a lot of income from some of the retreats that I preach. And uh, I had four retreats that were canceled and about seven other talks. And um, the, um, I'm just saying this just, it's just to illustrate, I'm fine, you know, but I mean, I was kind of, so I actually had to ask the IRS to give me a payment plan this year because I didn't have enough available cash um, I have plenty of retirement stuff stored away, but the uh, I didn't have enough cash to pay to pay the taxes because I didn't I lost a third of my income. You know, so I think what what, what I'm trying to say by way of, way of illustration is that again we we tend to get pretty, you know, uh, puffed up about our plans and what we're going to do and how we're going to go here and do such and such and make some money over here and <laughs> God's kind of laughing. You know, if you want to make God laugh, tell him your plans, All right? Mm -hmm. So um, there's, a, there's a real tendency for us to uh, kind of forget that my life is in your hands, Lord. My life is in your hands. Now, this then is also a recipe, though, for paradoxically, for serenity. Uh, it's interesting. We tend to think, 
that if I just have everything under control, I won't be anxious. So that's, that's not true. It's not true. In fact, we become more anxious. So just to illustrate, look at the big picture. We've never been able to control so many things. We can control the environment. I've got lights on right now, even though it's dark outside. If it's hot, I've got air conditioning. Um, we can, uh, you know, we can drive places. We got medicine. We got all kinds of stuff. And uh, we, we, it helps us to, quote, control a lot of things. Are we less anxious? More anxious. You know, more than half the country is on psychotropic meds. Um, the three tallest buildings in Chicago are insurance buildings. You know, we're a very anxious, nervous people. We're, there's a lot of fear and a lot of anxiety, even though we can control things more than we ever have before. So what happens is that it leads to expectations that are unrealistic and we get anxious about losing our comfort and losing our control. So the paradox is that you're actually, if you can abandon this idea of being in control of most things, um, then you, uh, you become more serene. I, was, uh, I, had a, I had a nervous breakdown in my 30s. Uh, I was sent to a parish as a pastor. I wasn't able to handle it. Uh, I was a young priest. I was only four years ordained. The parish was in an impossible situation. We just cut off notices. They were trying to keep a school open that should have been closed 20 years ago. Uh, it was just, it was just an impot, and I just had a nervous breakdown because I thought I had to get, so get everything under control. Well, anyway, I went to the, um, uh, psychiatric doctor here, the, the priest, and, uh, he, I said, Kanish, I said, I, I, I've come because I want to get my life under control again. I never want that to happen again. <laughs> he took off his glasses and shook his head. He said, Charles, until you let go of this idea of being in control, you'll never be well. And I thought he was a mad. Said, you, you should be in the nut house. You put on. <laughs> but anyway, I, I've come to learn that there's a lot of paradoxes in life. And one of them is that if you think you're going to be less anxious, if you have everything under control, think again, because that's what we do. And we're more anxious, not less. Okay. It creates expectations and it generates fears. Um, well, okay. So just trust God. He's, generally come through for me. You know, I haven't always gotten everything I wanted, but my gosh, he's been awfully good to me, you know? All right. Well, again, moving on then, let's get on now. We get, we get here to a warning um, uh, to the rich. And again, this is a, I want you to remember something I said to you probably two weeks ago, that the culture in which James lived was not a culture of a lot of social mobility. Generally, the poor weren't going to expect to somehow uh, work their way up to becoming rich. It was just, there were just less economic opportunities. People uh, who had wealth and land uh, held on to these things very tightly. Um, you were either a big, large land owning family or you was Paul. Um, so I, I don't want you to take this text we're about to read as an approval of class envy or hatred of the rich that sometimes goes on in this country. Um, I, uh, a poor man never gave me a job, only a rich man did, you know, so I think we have to understand that, um, there are decent, good people who are wealthy, uh, and there are, uh, indecent, terrible crooks who are wealthy too, but it's, it's, it's not to be, but anyway, let's go ahead and read it, if, if you would, Liz, uh, for, uh, the first, um, six verses. Come now, you rich, weep and howl for the miseries that are coming upon you. Your riches are, have rotted, and your garments are moth-eaten. Your gold and silver have rusted, and their rust will be evidence against you, and will eat your flesh like fire. You have laid up treasure for the last days. Behold, the wages of the laborers who mowed your fields which you kept back by fraud, cry out, and the cries of the harvesters have no reached the ears of the Lord. Suppose you have lived on the earth in luxury and in pleasure. You have fattened your heart in a day of slaughter. You have condemned, you have killed the righteous man, he does not resist. 
against you. Okay, pretty extreme stuff here, right? Um, mm. He has a particular, you know, one of, the, one of the sins that cries to heaven for vengeance is withholding a wages, um, you know, from people and, um, you know, that they worked for, you know. Uh, people very often depended on those wages uh, almost every day, you know, like, like, the, like the day laborers and so on. So um, it says here that um, there's an interesting thing. It talks about how your gold is rusted and your, your garments are rotted. Of course, this is ultimately true, isn't it, right? Every, everything that you have um, will either rust or will go to somebody else, but you're not going to continue to have it. Now, um, the other thing about this is uh, it's an interesting little we often talk about, you know, they, they killed the fatted calf. What, what, why do they call it the fatted calf? Well, most people, if they had a, um, if they had a, uh, uh, say a dog, I'm not, I'm not, uh, like um, a, 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 a cow or a, some animal like this, they would use it as a beast of burden to pull wagons and things like that most of its life. But when it came time to say, it's gonna, we're going to use it for food now, they put the thing in the stall for about six months and let it eat and eat and eat. So the last six months for the cow or the calf or the, uh, was um, uh, the, the nicest six months of their life. But they were being fattened for the slaughter. <laughs> Cruel joke. You know? Boy, I, I'm, I'm really, I don't have to pull the wagon anymore and go out there and plow and plow, help plow the field and uh, and life is fine, yeah, for the next six months, and then here comes the, here comes the, the knife. So, uh, it, it, in a way, what, what James is sort of saying here is that um, you, you, you rich, you know, better think about the fattened calf. I mean, you're living really well, but God's fattening you up for the slaughter <laughs> because you've been unjust and, and uh, to your workers, and and you've um, you have been you have uh, haven't been generous and kind and so on. So I think we can see from the context here that James is not necessarily talking about all rich people, but um, but rather to those who are particularly unjust or unkind or ungenerous. So Saint Paul says, advise those who are rich to use their wealth to make uh, to make friends, for, so that when that wealth fails them, uh, how, did, how did he put? It? They will have a treasure waiting for them in heaven. Jesus says something very similar. He says, store up your treasure in heaven where moth and rust and things can't corrode. So how do you store up something in heaven? Do you put it in a rocket ship? Do you send it up in a balloon? You know, you, the paradox is if you want to keep something for eternity, you give it away. You put it into the hand of the poor and the needy. Uh, this is how you store up treasure in heaven. Jesus goes on to say, therefore I say to you, make friends in, your, in this world for, for yourself through your use of your unrighteous money so that when it fails you, they, namely the poor you've helped, will welcome you into eternal dwellings. And we've talked about this before, but as you go to the judgment seat, it's pretty nice to think that maybe a lot of the poor would say, be good to him, Lord. He was good to us. Now, that, not that you can buy your way into heaven, but the point is that God is very concerned with how we treat the poor. It's very important to him. And, um, it, you know, if, if, if we've been good to the poor, God has promised us that he will be good to us. And, um, you know, the measure that you measure to others will be measured back to you. And if you put your bread on the water, says uh, the book of Ecclesiastes, cast your bread on the water, it will come back to you after many days. So if you, like, throw a leaf out on the water, the rings bring it back to you on the shore. So you see that that's the picture. So uh, at the end of the day, what we want to say is that um, James is advising something similar here, but more by way of warning, right? So he's saying, look, you know, you... You've done all these things, and God, you know, you think, look at me, I'm living fine. You're like that calf in the stall who's not having to pull the wagon. You're being fattened for the kill. See? And uh, you're going to be the meal. So he even mentions that about, you know, you're, you're, you'll be eating your own flesh and stuff like that. So, okay. So, again, um, we'll, we'll move on. But, but just, again, remember that um, this is a very important theme in James, and it was a very important theme in the early church, to care for the poor because many of them were poor, uh, especially because they came, they came to know Christ. Many of them were they lost their families, their jobs, and thrown out of synagogues. A lot of their support systems were gone. So it was a very important virtue. But of course, um, okay, well, we'll leave it at that. But God really cares about this. Okay. All right, let's go on to our 7 through um, 11. Anybody else want to read? Okay. No? Okay. 
Okay, good. Be patient, therefore, brothers, until the coming of the Lord. See how the farmer waits for the precious fruit of the earth, being patient with it until it receives the early and the late rains. You too must be patient. Make your hearts firm, because the coming of the Lord is at hand. Do not complain, brothers, about one another, that you may not be judged. Behold, the judge is standing before the gates. Take as an example of hardship and patience, brothers, the prophets who spoke in the name of the Lord. Indeed, we call blessed those who have persevered. You have heard of the perseverance of Job, and you have seen the purpose of the Lord, because the Lord is compassionate and merciful. So again, there's this, um, what I was saying earlier, you know, in a certain sense, James is saying, you better snap too. But he's also teaching us here to be patient, you know, that the the harvest of our holiness and the harvest of justice take time. And um, so again, the farmer sows a seed and uh, waits until it, it, the, the rains come and the, the plant puts forth its fruits and then there's the harvest. So it must be this in our life too. And a lot of times I think we can get impatient and kind of discouraged sometimes about ourselves. Uh, right. But keep praying, keep waiting on the Lord, keep, uh, keep close to the Lord and... Um, uh, it will come. Now, as I look back over my life, I can say that uh, in the last two, three years, I don't see a huge difference, but I can certainly say over the last 30, 35, 40 years, there's a huge difference. I'm not the man I used to be. And a great, great change has come over me, you know. Um, so um, there's um, already a sense of the harvest, but the full harvest, of course, will come when one day we're perfected in heaven. But he says here, he also warns us not to grumble. Therefore, in other words, be patient, not just with yourself, but be patient with your brothers and sisters. Um, you know, there's a, there's a lot of patience required in human relationships. The word patience is a very interesting word. It comes from the Latin root word patior, P-A-T-I-O-R. And this word patior means I suffer. So patience is a form of being willing Either, either having a capacity or a willingness to suffer, usually on account of other people for some greater good. So I, I want to stay in, in a relationship with the people I love, but I have to be patient and endure and realize that they're, uh, they're a work in progress, even like I am. And um, I, uh, I, I have to accept that uh, growth is slow and it takes time and that... Uh, uh, so again, um, I will say in some people in my life uh, that I know, I've seen great progress. Other people, not so much. Sometimes they even go backwards. <laughs> but somewhere along the line, we have to learn to stay in that longer conversation with people. Even those who seem the most resistant. You've heard all of my stories about how the rectory doorbell rings and Father, it's been 40 years since my last confession. Oh boy, somebody's been praying for you. See, you know, and you, you've heard my stories. I mean, very often the person doesn't even live to see the harvest. They've been praying for, they die and suddenly a rectory doorbell rings somewhere and kind of talk to the priest. And the person for whom that person had been, maybe it's a wife praying for her husband. She's dead now. She's going to, she's going to go to God if we pray, but, but now I'm reaping a harvest that I didn't sow. She sowed that, those seeds and she watered them with her tears and, now I'm reaping a harvest. So don't, don't ever give up until a person has breathed their last breath, you know? Um, so um, I'll be going next week to visit someone who uh, has been away from the church for 40 years. She's now in hospice and is asking for the sacraments. Okay. Somebody must've been praying for her. Okay. All right. So um, th th there's this patience that we have to have for ourselves and also for one another. And don't grumble um, again. And he gives some examples here. By the way, the prophets, that's an interesting example. We don't think of them as being patient. Thus saith the Lord. But, you know, look at the resistance they faced. They got thrown in jail. Some of them got killed. But they just patiently, not patient. We think patient meaning calm. No, they were willing to suffer to save souls. You see? Pasi, patior, right? It's not just, you know, being meek and waiting and kind of, you know, being passive, it's, 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 a, it's a consistent, persistent preaching, despite lack of results uh, or uh, resistance and, and even, you know, personal loss. That's, that's the patience that's being described here, okay? 
Now, uh, above all, brother, uh, don't, oh, I'll just read this last one here. Uh, then Kyle, I'll get you to read toward the end. Uh, but above all, brothers, don't swear, either by heaven or by earth or by any other oath. Let your yes be yes and your no be no, that you may not fall under condemnation. And he's really kind of paraphrasing Jesus here, who says the same thing in the Sermon on the Mount. Now, look, um, some Christians have taken these two passages by James and also by Christ to mean they can never swear an oath, like when you go to court and you're asked to raise your right hand, um, or you take a, a government job and they swear you in, you know, that kind of a thing. Uh, I, I think that you, th that misses the context. Um, the, the context uh, was that people used to swear about so many things, and they'd swear with different formulas. So remember how Jesus was rebuking the scribes and the Pharisees one day. He says, you, you hypocrites. He says, you say if you swear by the temple, you're not obliged, but if you swear by the gold in the temple, you are obliged. Or he says, you say that if, if, if you uh, swear by the, uh, the altar, you're not obliged, but if you swear by the gift at the altar, you're obliged. You're not, I mean, what is wrong with you all? Just speak the truth. Now, when I was a kid, we used to have a bad habit as kids. I don't know if it was common among adults at that time, but back in the 60s and early 70s, we kept saying, oh, I swear to God, I swear to God, you know. And eventually, you know, one of our religious teachers says, stop doing that. You know, just be a man of your woman of your own word, and don't don't bring God in to to, uh, to to vouch for you, except in the most solemn moments where that's absolutely necessary. Now, why do we see that it's necessary to swear people in on courts? Well, until recently, we still had a, re a patina of religion in our culture, and to put your hand on the Bible meant basically that you put your left hand on the Bible, you raise your right hand, and to swear. It uh, means that uh, if, if I am not telling the truth, may every curse in this book come upon me and my family. And that was a pretty good guarantee that someone was going to speak the truth up there. You're under oath now. Uh, and you've sworn before and you, you, you invoke the name and the, and the word of God. And um, you better speak the truth. And for most people who used to fear hell and lived in a more, in more religious times, that was a pretty big motivator. And it also helped people in the courtroom to think, well, this guy's probably telling the truth. Now, again, there could be, even in the old days, there could be people that were so, um, you know, without a conscience that they could just do that and just still go and lie. But at the end of the day, once you've done something that solemn, um, you know, if you have any fear of God in you, you're going to tell the truth. Okay. Now, uh, so there's a, there are rare reasons, but basically the Catholic approach to texts like these is to say, seldom swear, except in the most serious moments where it's required so that everyone can, you know, be assured that uh, the truth and justice is being upheld. Okay. So, um, yeah, so then, like Jesus said, let your yes mean yes and your no mean no. And if everything else is from the devil, you know, all this stuff. I swear to God, I didn't swear by the gold in the temple. I just swore by the temple. <sighs> away, away with you, you know, away with all that. Okay, okay Kyle, could you take us out to, to uh, the um, to the end? Sounds good. Starting at uh, verse 13. 13, yeah. Is anyone among you suffering? He should pray. Is anyone in good spirits? He should sing praise. Is anyone among you sick? He should summon the presbyters of the church. They should pray over him and anoint him with oil in the name of the Lord. And the prayer of faith will save the sick person and the Lord will raise him up. If he has committed any sins, he will be forgiven. Therefore, confess your sins to one another and pray for one another that you may be healed. The fervent prayer of a righteous person is very powerful. Elijah was a human being like us, yet he prayed earnestly that it might not rain, and for three years and six months it did not rain upon the land. Then he prayed again, and the sky gave rain, and the earth produced its fruit. My brothers, if anyone among you should stray from the truth, and someone bring him back, he should know that whoever brings a sinner back from the error of his way will save his soul from death, and will cover a multitude of sins." Yeah. And that, by the way, goes back to that, what I said to you earlier, who you, who are you to judge your neighbor? See, again, we're judging behavior and we, we, it's, it's proper for us to call a sinner back from their ways. So that's not judging. See, why would he, he didn't get his own memo, apparently, if he meant you have no right to ever question anybody's behavior. That's not what it means to not judge others. Okay. 
that's enough of that. Now, we have here basically um, a couple of things that are important doctrinally and sacramentally regarding two sacraments, confession and an anointing of the sick. So again, the question, is there anyone sick among you or suffering? Okay, let him, let him pray. Um, is anyone cheerful? Let him sing praise. Oh, it goes on to say here, um, uh, is anyone among you sick? Okay, then let him, uh, let him call for the presbyters of the church. Some translations say elders. Technically, presbyter means elder, but in the early church, the use of this in the New Testament indicates an office, not an age. So uh, presbyter is just a, a in English, the word priest in English is just a mispronunciation of the word presbyter. So you can see how it would come down through the centuries, you know, presbyter, presbyter, priest, you know. Uh, so it ends up becoming a, um, the, you know, it's, it's the word for priest. This is not just any old person. You bring an old person and, and, and uh, uh, have them pray over them. That's not what this text is saying. Presbyter, again, just to be clear, is an office, is, is what we today call priest, all right? So let him send for the priest of the church, if you will, okay? And let them pray over him, anointing him with oil in the name of the Lord. And the prayer of faith will save the one who is sick. Now, that doesn't necessarily mean they instantly heal them physically. Save means, you know, to, to, to put their soul out of the danger uh, by the forgiveness of their sins. Um, says here, the prayer of faith will save the one who is sick, and the Lord will raise him up. And if he's committed any sins, his sins will be forgiven. Now, therefore, confess your sins one to another, and pray for one another that you may be healed. Now, but I want you to notice the context. When he says, confess your sins one to another, it doesn't just mean, okay, everybody huddle up and just say what you've done. That's not, the context is the calling of the presbyter. So the fulfillment of the text, confess or declare your sins to one another, is, is there's a context. It's not just anybody, but the, the, the context is the calling of the presbyter, the calling of the priest. So again, the fulfillment of the text, declare your sins one to another, is the calling of the priest. All right. Now, this, is, this makes sense, first of all, practically, because people in community are not always able to keep confidences. It's a very poor idea to be in a communal setting talking about your very personal sins. People are gossips, people spread words. So that wouldn't even be wise just to just, you know, everybody just talk about your sins now. Uh, there's a funny joke I have to say, it's a little off color, so, but it goes like this. Um, there, there, there were at the, there was a, the, the Baptist revival at the Chautauqua tent and uh, the three of the ministers from several congregations was up front there and, uh, in, you know, down in the deep south there in Alabama. I said, now look, y'all, time to declare your sins. So go ahead, shout out some of your sins and we'll tell you that you're forgiven. So one man said, well, I stole some things a few years ago. He says, brother, the Lord forgives you. Another man said, well, I was unfaithful to my wife some years ago. He says, brother, the Lord forgives you. The third guy gets up and says, I had sex with a goat. <laughs> the, the one minister jabbed the other one and says, I wouldn't have told that one. <laughs> <laughs> I know I know it's a little off color, but, when I, but it, it, it illustrates that this is not the way, this is not what this text is saying, you know. Let's all put up the Chautauqua tent and we'll all come up on the morning bench, the morning bench, you know, that we weep and, and say what we've done uh, to the whole crowd. That's, that's, that's just not good. <laughs> all right. Not everybody can handle it and not everybody can keep confidences. So again, notice again, there's a context where this phrase, declare your sins to one another. And what is that context? The calling of the priest, okay? Now, so it also mentions that the priest has the power to forgive sin. Now, in this case, it seems to be linked with the sacrament of the sick. Uh, there's other places where the sacrament of confession is treated separately, like in John 20, where he breathes on them and gives them the power to, to uh, forgive or retain sin. Um, but this, uh, this includes anointing. But I will say the church's understanding of this is that when we go to anoint the sick, if they're able to confess their sins, they should first go to confession, especially if they're dying. 
Uh, now, if they're unconscious or whatever, you know, you, you give them the absolution and then you anoint them uh, with oil. Um, but um, the two sacraments are linked. Now, some years ago, I got into some trouble here. Ms. You may remember uh, some of you who are parishioners here. We had this, con we had, the, we had this, um, oh, what was it, a, a kind of a tradition of twice a year summoning people to come for an anointing mass. And everyone, you know, who, who said that they wanted to be anointed for the sick would be anointed. See, the problem with that is that indiscriminate anointing of people is not really a good thing. So what I decided to do, though, was I also said this. If you come for the sacrament of anointing for this mass, you should first have your confession heard. It really wouldn't be appropriate for you who are still able to get out and come to church to go to have anointing of the sick without first going to confession. Well, we went from about 200 people down to about 20. <laughs> and I was ro ro roundly uh, criticized for this move. Um, but I, I mean, it, somewhere we have to get this uh, lid back on the sort of what I would say indiscriminate anointing. Normally, it's a, it's a person who's seriously sick, not just, well, I'm, I'm kind of having headaches or... Now, granted, though, the elderly who have chronic illnesses can be anointed on a regular basis. When I say regular, you know, several times a year. But, but the point being is that the, the indiscriminate where you pile 200 people into church and God knows what's wrong with most of them. They look pretty healthy or even if they don't look healthy, they look like it's that grave. Um, so I, I think that, uh, that uh, we were trying to sort of rein that in a little bit, not just in our parish, but throughout the diocese and to relink re the sacrament of the sick with the sacrament of confession. They belong together and you see that in a text like this, okay? So, um, Father, when are we gonna have another anointing mass? I said, well, um, as soon as you wanna have one. I mean, but again, here's the, here's the deal. <laughs> if you're healthy enough to come to church, you can get into that confessional before mass and I will, I will have several priests on hand and come to confession first and then get anointed. Okay. Um, all right. So the, um, and in a hospital setting, again, having a confession isn't always possible if the person is either you know, in dementia or whatever. So the priest can say, if you can understand what I'm saying, just call to mind any sins and you don't have to say them out loud because they, they can't, you know, they're just, they can't speak. But, um, but just know that I'm going to be about to give you absolution. Okay. We also give for a person who's definitely dying. I mean, within, we're saying their death is within days. We give something called the apostolic pardon, which is by the power invested in me by the Holy and apostolic See, I remove all punishments from you in this life and in the life to come in the name of the father, son, and the Holy spirit. But that of course implies uh, that they're uh, free of all that uh, it's like getting a plenary indulgence, but all the usual conditions apply. So it's not just a ticket to ride, okay? But uh, that's the tradition. All right. So then it says here, confession sins. Yeah. Uh -huh. Yes. Is that what they did? Is that what you did with Kevin? Uh huh. Yes. That that last day that I was with you and him there at the yeah, nursing home. The last home. day. Uh huh. He died. Yeah. I okay. gave him the apostolic pardon. Yeah. I was wondering what. I was what? Oh, I'm... Wondering what you what took so long? I didn't know you had it. I was wondering what oh. took so long. Yeah. Okay. When you were in yeah the room with him, I didn't think he had any more sins left. <laughs> <laughs> well, anyway, yeah. I cannot. I can neither affirm or deny anything that happened uh, in the confession part of it. But I certainly gave the apostolic pardon. Okay, finally then, you know, this idea of the prayer, the righteous one uh, availeth much or, you know, is the, the, the it's interesting, the, um, this translation seems to leave something out. You might remember the older translations that the effective, fervent prayer of the righteous one availeth much. Now, um, the, the reason why two words are used there is the Greek word sort of says the stretched out prayer of, of the righteous one. It's hard to render it in English. They just completely ignore the word here in this translation. They just say the, uh, the prayer of the righteous person has great power. Um, but anyway, it's, the understood here is the effective or fervent um, stretched out kind of prayer that, that a person it really prays, you know, not just, I, I said a prayer for you. 
you know, it's not it's not that you know it's uh, that real you know a person who's really known to be a person of prayer. Okay. And now we give some examples of Elijah, but uh, let's just pass over that for now. My brothers, if any, here comes uh, the final thing. Uh, if anyone among you wanders from the truth, someone brings him back. Let him know that whoever brings back a sinner from his wandering will save his soul from death and cover a multitude of sins. Whose soul, whose sins? Well, likely his soul is the soul of that sinner and will cover a multitude of sins. Maybe that, maybe that, that's one way you, cover, you have a lot of your own sins forgiven to bring a sinner back. Uh, so it's hard to say to whom it applies. But notice something very important. We see an erring brother or sister. Oh, well, you know, that's how it is today. People are just that way. Some people's children. Oh, well, you know, everybody's doing that. You know, we make, we just, and we don't have the urgency that Jesus did to call sinners and some of them to repentance. What were the very opening words out of his mouth? Repent and believe the good news. Well, Jesus, that's not welcoming language. We, in our church, all are welcome. I mean, we have this sort of smarmy attitude and we, we just, we just we neglect texts like this that if someone is in sin, we need, someone needs to go and try to get them out of it and correct them and, and admonish and urge. And they may reject you, but at least try. And don't go on just overlooking. Like, you know, sometimes what happens at Thanksgiving, you know, uh, the matriarch says, now we are all going to be nice at the Thanksgiving table and we are not going to mention the fact that Jane and Joe are shacked up and that, that uh, <laughs> Josephine used to be Joseph. You know. Okay, maybe we don't do it right at the Thanksgiving table, but I'll tell you a Thanksgiving about eight, eight or nine years ago, uh, I had to take one of my cousins and come, cousin, come out here for a minute. You know, he was dating a married woman well, the divorce will be final in a couple of months. He'd been married two times. He couldn't date and she shouldn't be dating. And I said, cousin, I love you. But look at me, I got, I'm a priest and I, I have to, but I'm telling you this as your, as your brother, your cousin, in other words. And you're going to face judgment one day, my friend. And I'm not going to say anything more just to say to you, be careful. But by the way, you got good taste in women. She's beautiful, but she's not for you. And I says, I won't raise this with you again, but I want to be very careful just for you to know that I, I want to warn you uh, that you're going to be facing judgment one day, and this is not pleasing to God. All right. Cousin, I love you. Let's go in for dinner. You know. Now, um, and it all, it, he took it well, and I, you know, I handled it well. I, I think I handled it well. But there's another time where, I mean, I've had parishioners sometimes who come to talk to me. Or I had to some, I, I've sometimes had a few parishioners I had to say, you come talk to me. I remember saying to one not so long ago, now look, I want to tell you something. Um, not only should you not be going to communion right now, but if you persist in what you're doing, and I can't reveal what it was, but let's just say it was a very serious thing. You, not, only, you said, not only should you not be going to communion until you get to confession and repent, but you'll probably go to hell. Now, people never talk like this anymore, see? Now, even, even in a more friendly way, now, sometimes I had to be firm with that person because he was really messing up and harming people, really harming people, okay? So I warned him. I said, you're going to stand before God. And it's not going to go well because scripture says, and I, I quoted some scriptures, and I said, blank, you know, so-and-so, so-and-so will not inherit the kingdom of heaven. Okay. Now, um, maybe a friendlier way, though, maybe like if you have a son or a daughter who's not going to church, you know, you could say, you know, dear, I, I just want you to know, I really hope you'll get back to God's house and the sacraments and so on. And, you know, it's just, I'm just concerned. I just don't want you to go to hell. You know, and you could go to hell. I mean, <gasps> You know, you know, we've lost, this is, this was normal biblical language until not so long ago, even, even 50, 60 years ago, you know, priests would warn of hell and uh, parents would also, you know, and um, the, the fear of hell was more of a, a motivator than it is today. So I don't know exactly how to get the balance right. You don't want to just simply terrify people. Um, but on the other hand, I think we have to be honest and say to them, this is not pleasing to God according to his own word. See? So anyway, how, how we get back into the business of fraternal correction is going to be, you know, based a little bit on your own personality, but we got to stay in that business. And priests have to get better in the pulpit about being clear about right and wrong and warning people and, 
you know me, most of you have preached, heard me preach over the years, you know, I don't, I don't mince any words. There's a hell and people go there. And the, mo the one who talks the most about it is Jesus. Nobody loves you more than Jesus, and yet nobody warned about hell and judgment more than Jesus. 21 of the 38 parables are devoted to that topic. Sheep and goats, wheat and tares, you know, you've heard me on this. So again, I, I would just simply say that James is saying here, this is an important work. And it brings great reward if there's repentance. It's hard work, and you'll get it with both barrels half the time. But be willing, it says, St. Paul says, if a brother is detected in sin, you who are spiritual should set him right. But do so gently so that you don't, you know, lose your own way. But um, do so with gentleness and patience. But he set him right. And he says, um, and he says, um, how did he put it? He said, um, um, he says, oh, bear, he says, bear one another's burdens. It's a burden to correct a, a sinner. It's burdensome. And they'll, get, they'll sometimes hurl back, well, what about you? And, you know, and there's a lot of fear and trouble associated, but we've, we've gotten even to the point now where a lot of parents don't correct their children like they should, you see? All right. Well, my sermon will be ended, okay? It's just late. But we got through it. We got through it, even with a motor mouth like me. Now, uh, for a little bit of break for you, um, we're going to see that Seth is going to pick up with the next page, which is the first letter of Peter. Um, he'll be teaching. Um, next week on this. He's looking forward to that. Um, and uh, I do you want to say a word or two or you just want to? Yeah. Um, so it's going to be super great. So make <laughs> sure that uh, you come and invite people. Everyone's going to want to be there. Yeah. Uh, it's going to be great. Uh, we'll begin by talking about like some introductory materials. It'll be, you know, author yeah. setting place, audience, things like that. Um, and so within that segment, there won't be a lot of opportunity for interaction probably, but if there are any kind of like things, just like things you want to interject, be sure to do that. Um, then we'll get through at least the first three verses. Um, and so that's kind of like the beginning segment there, kind of like an introductory to the letter. Um, I'd suggest that everyone read probably the first half of the book, uh, going through verse 12, uh, just in preparation. We, we definitely won't cover all of that, but, um, it'll be good to at least read through it, you know, um, once or twice before, uh, we meet. So it's kind of in your mind and, you know, bring any thoughts, you know, questions, ideas, uh, things that you want to talk about, uh, because usually uh, my manner of uh, Bible study is uh, to begin with what y'all find interesting. I'll usually, you know, have someone read, and then, you know, so what are our first thoughts on this particular passage? And then we'll kind of move from there. Uh, and then I'll obviously have some ideas and things that I want to talk about as well. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, it's going to be a great time, so I'm really looking forward to it. Good. First Peter, you said? First Peter. Yeah. yeah, the book of First Peter. So it's right after the book of James. Okay. It's got a lot of topics, but uh, including, including community living, but, but it's, it, it, it's, it has a lot of beautiful passages on, on the theology of suffering and, and so on, too. So a lot of good, a lot of good themes that are treated there. And uh, you have a very enthusiastic teacher. Oh, I know. <laughs> I, and, yeah. and, and I know Seth can get... Uh, 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 filled with the Holy Spirit, mm -hmm. and um, he's a good teacher, mm -hmm. and um, I'm excited. I want you all to uh, be excited uh, as well. I can testify mm -hmm. uh, the young man is, can, is, is good, and um, mm -hmm. he can't get caught up. So we, uh, we, yeah, so uh, uh, he can get caught up. Uh, we'll have a timer. <laughs> we'll have a timer. <laughs> and, and I, I can't imagine anyone being long-winded. If he gets a subject that gets him set on fire, uh, somebody get a bucket. <laughs> or if he floats up off the screen and all you see are his feet, you know, somebody pull him down. 
The young man. I'll run good. down the hall and pull him down there, okay? I see he can get the Holy Ghost in him real quick. All right. Yes. <laughs> Elizabeth, you're a delight. <laughs> <laughs> okay well listen yeah so spread the word and um we'll uh we'll pick up with that theme next week and um good so let's pray all right i, I want to particularly remember uh devin uh, wright and his family uh who was um murdered on sunday uh 20 years old and um we asked for his repose and for the uh uh for justice as well and um, we also ask and pray lord especially for his family now in a time of shocking uh, sorrow and grief lord we ask also now for all of us who have studied this word uh, we, we covered a lot lord and we'll forget a lot but help us to remember what we need to remember um what most is necessary in our life so uh, thank you for the book of james and we look forward to the first letter of peter and we ask you to send your anointing on uh, Seth, who will lead us. Thank you, Lord. And the Almighty God bless you all, the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. 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 Thank you. Thank you. Amen. Sweet dreams. Night now, bitch. Night now, bitch. Night now, bitch. Night now, bitch. everybody. Bye, y'all. Bye. I'll stop by. Okay. Thank you, too. Night, Monsignor. Night. Blessings. Blessings.